My name is Dan Stringer, and I am the board chair at Gateway Center of Excellence in Rural Health. Gateway's mi central mission is to improve the health and well being of rural residents through research, education, and communication. We are located in Godrich, Ontario, and to our knowledge, we are the only community based rural health research center in Canada governed by a volunteer board of directors. We have partnered with several academic institutions, including the University of Waterloo School of Pharmacy, and today's lecturer is a research assistant at this school. Today's lecture is titled Uncertain COVID-19 Messages, the Perspectives of Rural Older Adults. This lecture will delve into how, during times of great upheaval, such as a pandemic, flexible and changing public messaging may occur when scientific foundations are still unclear and uncertain and knowledge is evolving, and how this evolving messaging ties into community resilience. There are still ongoing challenges of public health mess messaging around COVID-19. This fact makes this lecture timely and significant to our rural communities. Our lecturer today is Dr. Hung Nguyen, research assistant at the University of Waterloo School of Pharmacy. His research seeks to fully mainstream nonprofits in health governance and foster collaborations across systems and health partners. Joining him are Dr. Ashley Rose Mellenbacher, Canada Research Chair in Science, Health and Technology Communication, University of Waterloo. Dr. Fen Chang, clinical pharmacist specializing in geriatric pharmacotherapy and also Gateway Center of Excellence in Rural Health Research Chair and Board Member, and pharmacist Kristen Watt, owner of Kristen's Pharmacy in Southampton, Ontario. To thank our ongoing attendees, we give diplomas at the end of each semester to those with perfect attendance to recognize your commitment to and involvement with this education series. The lecturer and panelists will present, and afterward, we invite participants to ask questions or make comments via the Q&A or chat boxes. A brief disclaimer before we get started, the views expressed in this lecture may not necessarily reflect Gateway's views or opinions, but we believe in providing a platform for a range of perspectives and thoughtful discussion. I'm now gonna turn things over to you, Hung, and your panel. Take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hang, and I'm a research assistant in the University of Waterloo. Today, I'm going to share with you a the result of a study that we conducted a few months ago. We, we are going to talk about the COVID-19 messages in the perspective of older adults in rural areas in Ontario. In this presentation, I walk you through the development of research questions the material and states of the, of the research, how we analyze the data, and what we learn from data analysis. We are going to share some limitations of the research, and we leave rooms in the last of the presentations for questions and answers. As you may be aware, COVID-19 pandemic from rapid spread of health information to curb the spread of the disease. During the pandemic, you see that scientific evidence, the, the spreading of key messages and public health measures come at the same time. And no one's had the time and experience to judge whether those messages are good or whether those public health measures are good enough. We can see that there is a quick spreading of misinformation during the pandemic and that create profound impact on because that may increase the spread of the disease. In this research, we want to examine the uncertainty of COVID-19 messages during the pandemic through the perspective of older adults in rural, in rural areas in Ontario. Specifically, we are going to answer the questions of what are the participant perspective on accessibility and quality? I'm sorry, 
quality of the messages and the expectations for a community strategy for communication during the pandemic. In this research, we employ a qualitative, in, qualitative approach to our study. We conduct some structure interviews of research participants and uh, the ethics for this study was cleared by University of Waterloo. We employ several ways to recruit participants. We have a strong connections with, with pharmacists in the areas. We share the, the recruitment through our network. We also recruit on radios and we also design a posters to spread for the recruitment of research participants. The questions that we ask our participants are after we ask the participants about some demographic information like age and centers and ethnicity and occupations, we ask the participants to share their thoughts on what were the COVID-19 messages they were able to access, what action did they take in response to the messages they heard, and what their recommendation would be for an ideal strategy for communication in rural areas. The interview were recorded, and after that, uh, we conducted a thematic analysis of the data. In total, we were able to reach seven uh, research informants. All of them have very high level of education, and six of them are female, and one of them are male. What we learned uh, from this is uh, in terms of accessibility, our research informants say that uh, they have limited access to the information and even one participant say that they didn't find that reliable. After receive the messages, our research participants assume a high level of citizenship. They think they can play a, a level of responsibility to cooperate with the government to stay attuned to what was happening. In terms of quality of information, it, it depends on the sources of information that our research informant can access. But in general, they believe in university professors and they believe in the doctors because they believe that those professional provide a high level of uh, science in the messages. In the first two examples, you will see that our, our research informants um, receive a lot of information about news media rather than their rather than politicians. Our research informants say that the war, the government did a poor job messaging and responding to the pandemic. However, in the words of one uh, research informant, they really appreciate uh, their uh, mayor. Let me read. We had a mayor and he had an email. I'm sorry, he had a Facebook. And he did a lot of things to, you know, make people feel better and say things are going to happen and what you do virtually. In this example, we can see that if a, lo if a local politician uh, do something special, do something specific and concrete, that could be highly appreciated by community people. In this example, you see that um, the research informant received uh, messages from several sources of information, and they do the job of triangulating information. They compare, they verify the quality of the messages across the sources of information that they they receive. In in the second um, in the middle box in here, you see that our research informants. Uh, have a strong network and they trust in through the words of mouth. According to me, that may have an impact on communication if we are going to have another pandemic, which means that 
uh, words of mouth and network need to be taken into account if politicians or professionals want to disseminate messages, especially in rural communities. And one thing that I want to stress in here is our research informants uh, show a high level of trust in science. This slide show about the vulnerability of older adults in rural areas. The adults in rural areas, there is no public trans transportation. The people have limited access to a computers or the internet connections or the internet skills. The only way that they can get the news is the newspapers, but they have limited information. And um, in the last example, you see that sometimes the government uh, disseminate messages that may be very confusing to uh, older adults. In this example, we see that the government say that the COVID-19 is over, but it turned out to be that people are still wearing masks. So with older adults in rural areas, that is really confusing because the COVID-19 is, is over, but why people are still wearing masks? Very confusing. And that is this slide show the negative impact that the COVID-19 uh, messages have on older adults in rural areas. In the first example, one preserved participants say that they consider suicide. In the second examples, they say we are sinking, we are going down with the ship. And in the third example, they say, I feel like we are in a war, in a war, at a war. So personally, for me, I think the word suicide, going down with the ships and the world are very strong words. And I honestly didn't expect to hear from our research informant. But in reality, I heard from them. And those words suicide, going down with the ship and were really stricter thoughts. How negative, uh, how negatively impacts that uh, messages uh, may have on older adults in rural areas. In this slide, I'm going to present the expectations for a good community strategies in terms of content of the information. Our research informants uh, suggest to have some humor. They suggest to make it fun and they suggest to use to disseminate messages that are simple and with a lot of pictures. It answers the question of who are the, who disseminates the messages. They, su they suggest that government and public health representative should come together to disseminate the messages. When asked about how the, the messages should be disseminated, they say that the messages should be disseminated in various form to ensure accessibility, to ensure accessibility amongst uh, populations. And the la in the last point, uh, our research informant confirmed that community engagement is very important in conveying messages because Community engagement relates to community resilience and it also relates to trust. So what do we learn from this uh, study? We learned that the government did not do a good job in populations and the type of communications they best respond to. We learned that populations have a high level of variable accessibility to messages. We learned that our research informants want messages that are personalized to their contacts. And we also learned about the importance of words of mouth in disseminating the key messages. Some limitations of the study, as you can see that we have very small sample size, only seven, uh, research informants. Uh, we were not able to reach diverse population, although we try our best to recruit research, uh, research informants. 
uh, and due to some uh, time and staffing limits and also uh, the geographical distance, we the only option that we interview is informant is is virtual. That we hope that if we have time and 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 if uh, possible, we do in depth interview and that should be an in person interview. Significant of this research, we're looking at a unique populations of older adults in rural areas. In, in that, we learned that the past experience may have an impact on current time. We know that in rural areas, everyone knows each other and to some extent control each other behaviors and rural areas where resources are scarce that need to be taken into account uh, when uh, in, in futures. And another significance of this study is we can build community resilience in regard to risk communications. Thank you, and I'm ready to take uh, questions. So, Hung, um, I think we should open this up to the panelists as well to speak to their experience around this and their um, information. And I look to Kristen in particular because she would have been frontline during this whole pandemic, what she heard and how she would um, see improving messaging for rural seniors. Kristen, are you prepared to speak to them? I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I own a small rural community pharmacy in Southampton and messaging was challenging for every one of my patients. In many times, patients actually would call us because they didn't understand the messaging. I got a call once from a patient saying, my neighbors are seeing her grandchildren, am I allowed? And I promise you, this was not something we learned in pharmacy school, um, but uh, patients were looking to us because they trusted us and helping us uh, disseminate all the information. Because like was said, when we hear COVID is over and then you find out that it's still circulating, that's very confusing. Mm -hmm. um, so how things that we can do to improve uh, would be finding out where our seniors are getting their information, newspapers and things like that, of course. Facebook, uh, a lot of information, uh, a lot of things have gone into other platforms. At the time, we could use Facebook for uh, information, sharing new sites in Canada. That's no longer the case. And that's a really big risk for our seniors if something happens again. Because where are they getting that? A newspaper in, in Goddard, King Carden, Bruce County, it prints once a week. We can't reach our people fast enough with this type of information. So then we have to look to other resources, uh, television series, et cetera. I found um, the use of CBC and uh, CTV and global uh, around experts. We all saw Isaac Bogosh everywhere all the time. I think that was fantastic. A lot of Canadians came to trust him and his messaging. And it was very kind and generous because we don't get paid whenever we do media interviews. So it was very kind and generous of him to give his time like that. I think uh, as we move forward and understand um, what may come next is to engage with seniors more in understanding where they access that information and can we get it to them? Because like I said, Facebook, we can't use anymore. Uh, print publications are time limited. Uh, so we are going to be looking at TV and other social media places. The other panelists, Fenn, do you have any comment here on this, on your experience? Thank you, Dan. And uh, thanks, Hong. Great presentation. Very uh, well summarized. Um, just for the audience, Hong is a qualitative researcher, which means that instead of numbers, he works with um, data. He works with words and, uh, and, and he interprets those words in telling a story. So he's looking at what what uh, the narrative is, what's happening, and, uh, and what may be underneath what you're seeing in terms of what's happening. Um, so through he actually was, uh, you know, oversaw this whole project. Too. But what I learned from it, one thing was putting my educator hat on for a second at the school of pharmacy. One thing is um, just how important it is to learn about the new media 
uh, types, right? The social media, the, the media itself, the tr even the traditional media, that is, those are powerful tools for these communities in terms of health information access, um, as I mentioned. And that is something that I would say we as healthcare providers get very little training in and, uh, and, and very little opportunities to practice except maybe on your personal um, social media. So uh, something to consider, I guess, for the next uh, age of the um, health professionals out there. Um, the other is that, uh, as I mentioned, the word of mouth strategies are really important for community engagement, especially for rural communities. And that's something we're continuously experiencing. Um, that level of trust is, is really important and that has to be built over time. Um, the and uh, and the third thing I'll just mention in terms of what I got from this um, uh, the this data is that um, Han mentioned you know one of the shortcomings is that uh, that inability to reach a more diverse wider audience uh, despite <laughs> best efforts the the so this particular group report a high level of trust in science, but what we find with interviews is that it is a self-selected group. So people who self-select into answering these questions probably have a bit of that tendency to start with, to want to get engaged with health information, want to learn about the evidence behind what people are saying, right? They so I'm not surprised to see that there is a high level of trust in science. Um, what I'm curious about is what about people who don't self-selecting to opportunities like this, right? So what might they have said? And, and actually, we really wanted to hear some of that, but uh, um, just unfortunately, we couldn't do that. But uh, those are questions kind of lingering in my mind as I hear this. Thank you. So oh, Ashley, your turn. Right. Well, and thank you for your presentation. Um, yes. Yeah, so I, I, I'll sort of echo some of what um, I think we're already talking about, but I think the multi-pronged approach to communication is sort of coming through as an important piece to this because there will be folks who are on social media, which of course um, now does have those challenges of sharing news, which we'll have to work around. I think there are also really important pieces for community leaders, um, and that could be, you know, uh, pharmacists, but also potentially religious leaders or other folks who are embedded within communities who are already trusted sources that folks can go to for information. So thinking kind of broadly about how those people um, can be, you know, sort of tapped into this network of health communication to really get messaging out effectively, especially where maybe social media is not necessarily going to be a particularly um, useful strategy. I think friends and family tie into that as well, um, thinking about who may be plugged in in different ways and how they can share that information. So in, in some ways, really thinking about the variety of ways that folks are going to come to information. And I do think that depends on whether or not you trust um, scientists and health professionals and, and probably especially government, right? When we look at the high level surveys, um, there are numerous surveys run across Canada. And what we see is before the pandemic, there, there was sort of um, good trust in, in scientists and, and health professionals that um, increased quite a bit at the beginning of the pandemic and then fell back down a little bit across the board. But we also see government and media also have certain issues or, or challenges around trust as well. So having multiple sources of information that are interacting so you can get the information you need is really, really important. And of course, the, the messaging itself, we want to think about um, not a deficit model where we're just sort of telling folks a lot of facts and, and hoping they'll agree with us, but but really sort of giving them the evidence they need and then sources of information or sources, uh, people, humans, they can talk to about what that means to them because nobody wants to be told what to do, right? But you want to be informed so you can make a good decision. I um, was thinking as you, oh, you were all speaking about um, one of our research chairs who did a, one of these lectures early on in the COVID pandemic, his main or key message was, the message keeps changing as we learn more. And that is good for a scientific approach or people with a scientific background. What I felt, and I'm sure many people felt was, I don't wanna hear any more of this, this is awful. 
And after a, 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 you know some weeks of, of this ongoing pandemic and constant messaging, constant interviewing, um, I'm sure I was not alone in wearying of this barrage of bad news over and over every evening. So my, my question to all of you would be, how do you get people to stay tuned in? And how, how do you get that changing message um, or an acceptance of that changing message and, and then disseminate it? Or do you block out time and have one message per week or one per month? Uh, we were getting multiple messages every day. Uh, depending on what time you turned on your radio or your television or looked at social media. I, I throw that open to all of you to, to see what you think. And I can start. So a few things that I found, uh, first of all, is negative cells. Um, I do a ton <laughs> of social media. I do a ton of media, print, um, radio, TV, negative cells. If I tweet, TikTok, whatever, about being exhausted, being tired, not having access, whatever. I get clicks, I get likes, and I get calls. If I talk about something big, exciting, and wonderful, much less, much less. So we have to remember that when we're seeing what we see. It's kind of like reading reviews um, of a hotel or resort. People will post the negative. It's very rare that people have a good experience and they'll go on and take the time. So remember that when, when gaining this information. And then the other thing was, in science and in science communication, we are very used to the evidence changing very quickly. We do an experiment and it's not what we expected. And now our entire course of research has changed paths. This is expected in our professions, but it is not expected by the general public. What happened previously is a vaccine would come out after many, many years of um, intensive scrutiny and, and research and all of these things. And it would be presented to the public one time. And what we had was things, the perception was that it happened very quickly, but when we share the information of, you know, 24 hours a day, having a million people working on these vaccines, that's why we were able to, the man hours are the same. It just happened really quickly. So those, that type of communication is, and, and providing that education and understanding that things change very quickly in science and we're all used to it. The general public may not be used to it, but guess what? This is actually how it does work and changing the narrative on, well, you're always changing your mind and you're always backtracking to, you know, with every new piece of information, I am updating the body of evidence in which I inform my opinions that I share. And so that's what I did with my patients and in all of my um, public facing education was this is real time. I learned about this 10 minutes ago, too, but I took the time and all of my years of background, practice and education to collate this information quickly and then translate it in a way that makes sense for the public. So oftentimes it comes down to picking that one person who you trust to do that, whether it's Isaac Bogosh on CBC or Kristen's Pharmacy on Facebook or University of Waterloo had amazing resources during this time. It's finding that we are very, there's so much information out there. We're very bad at getting it to the people who need it. So, Hung, what do you think? I think your, uh, your microphone's turned off. One mention about the research is that uh, during the pandemic, uh, scientific evidence and the in public health intervention happening at the same time, and no one had experience how to fix that. So that was over. But what I learned, what I think is what we learned from that. So, for example, now it is the time that the government think about a good uh, strategy how to communicate messages to um, specific. Uh, communities in this country. For example, it is time now uh, we can do research in local areas about what is the best way to communicate something in that area so that if a new uh, pandemic or new uh, event come in, then we have that strategy already and we use it as a frame to communicate the relevant messages to the communities. One thing that we are able to do that, uh, and that surprises me, is the research informants show a very high level of citizenship, which means that they are ready, that means to me that they are ready to cooperate and to collaborate with government in doing that. They are doing part of the responsibilities, they share the responsibility of the government, but what they need is just some flag, some 
some voice from the government and they are ready to help. Ben, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I just want to quickly latch onto what Han is saying in terms of, you know, th this is a group that we should really make use of because they have roots in the community and they already have the networks established and, and the, you know, the, the question is how do you access and kind of distribute, disseminate this information through them to their community peers? That would be really interesting to, to think about. Your thoughts on this? So, um, I, I, I wanted to add maybe a little bit of a different trajectory. I think part of the what I heard in your initial question too was maybe thinking a bit about expectation setting because I've heard a lot of folks say, you know, everybody said it's going to be three weeks, right? And here we are, years later, and this has happened. So. And I think in, in that domain, um, you know, this wasn't necessarily news to historians, for example, or history buffs who had looked at how pandemics have traditionally sort of unfolded over the course of years in the past. Now, of course, we have different interventions now and different th tools we can use like vaccines. But I think those kinds of groundings in what we've experienced and know can also help frame some of the expectations. So we can say this is going to be an evolving situation. We're not exactly sure. Here are some examples of what's happened in the past. Um, of course, now we have different kinds of science and technology, but, but there are certain elements that I think were missed initially that humanists, his, you know, mm -hmm. and, and not just academic humanists, right, but history buffs, folks who are interested in these subjects could really bring to bear museums, that kind of thing. And, and those are important pieces to consider in some of the conversations as well, because it really is also a, it's an effective experience, right? So people will get exhausted and fatigued from the constant negative messaging and, and finding sort of hope and optimism can be done through some of that work as well in, in looking at kind of how folks have overcome these moments before. Kristen made a good point about uh, the negative uh, gets attention. The uh, everybody wants to go see the automobile crash or the the house fire. Um, the, they're drawn to that disaster. But in this case, uh, personally, and I think generally, people very quickly got disaster fatigue, and and they didn't. Uh, I think the message just started bouncing off, or people weren't weren't accepting, I, I would hope that it should this happen again, and it probably will, that there is a time set aside or a place set aside for the message of the day or the week. This is the fact, this is real, and, and, and everything else you can filter out. Um, I, I think that as bad as the pandemic was, and, and as good as the outcome became, as vaccines became accessible, um, uh, I think uh, participation in the future by the public will have to be, it'll have to be studied, uh, not just what vaccine you develop, what messenger RNA tool you use, but how do you get the public at large to accept it? How do you, how do you get them to listen, to accept, and to act to get the vaccine? And And I don't think uh, from my perspective or what I'm hearing or seeing, there's really any talk about this. And uh, I'd like to throw it open to you, you know, for your suggestions of, of practical ways that this, uh, this message, these messages that Hung has, has gleaned from a few, a few participants, but also what we all hear in the, in the bigger world and what we're seeing in the media now how is this going to be made more effective? How should it be done to make it more effective? So Kristen, take it away. I think I think we need to depoliticize health. This is the first time it's really become political. It's it's you're on one side or another. There's left and right about vaccines. And and I mean, in the past, there was always some pushback against any public health initiative, seatbelts, the polio vaccine. Do you know why the majority of Americans got the polio vaccine? because Elvis Presley got it live on TV um, and depoliticized it and just brought it out. And, and people look to somebody, whether they trust him or not as a science expert, obviously, but those types of things is, is, is what we need to go back to. And we really need to depoliticize. We need our politics, uh, uh, local 
and federal and provincial to acquiesce to the professional health experts. And that is not being done. They are purposely using health and disinformation to create division and to gain votes. So we need to ask more of our political leaders in keeping our public safe um, and not feeding into that discourse. Uh And Fen, I'll go to you next. How do we do this better? If I had the answer to that, obviously I would be. Hey, Fen. Yeah, just just uh, Kristen, what you said reminded me of a story that I heard through the pandemic in terms of that whole discussion about masking, because uh, masking used to be a very standard thing that when you went into a hospital and you had a procedure, people put masks on, right? That was a way of respecting your health and, and theirs, I suppose. Um, but uh, yeah, that that was when during the pandemic, somebody brought that up to me to say, how did this become such a politicized uh, action? Um, so I think that's that's a very true reflection on that. Ashley, how do we do it better? Oh, I, I I would agree on the um, working to ensure it's not politicized. I think that mm -hmm. that's very dangerous, right? And it sort of also imports from the United States. We often see kind of these messaging and, and that sort of political division around it, which makes it really hard just to understand the information that we're getting. So I would agree that's a, a key point to um, that intervention. Now, how you do that, I think some of it is also just not accepting those kinds of discourse as, mm -hmm. as a reasonable political discourse, right, around health issues. And I'm speaking on behalf of my researchers, of my of my research informants, three things. Our research informants suggest three things. First, avoid top-down approach. Secondly, our research informants suggest that there should be a high a higher level of coordination among government departments in terms of communicating um, the key messages. And the third point, our research informant suggests that. Uh, there should be community engagement in disseminating the key messages. I think those three things that uh, our recent informants suggest that I would, uh, I would uh, forward those messages on to government level. Um, I see our uh, chat box and Q and A is starting to fill up here, so I'll just uh, bring up. Uh, uh, so. So a couple of questions here, Hung, I guess I'll direct this one to you. Do you know whether public health bodies in this country have received your study? Do you, has this been disseminated or published? <laughs> no, this, no, no, we didn't disseminate it. What, well, what do think... you think about that thing? Should you help answering that? Yeah, I guess the right, the, the accurate answer would be not yet, Dan, mm, uh, okay, but okay. Uh, yeah, we hope to do so. Yeah. Yeah, and and I, the other question there was, do you know if there's any action being taken to studying the best methods of communicating evolving messaging in a crisis? And I think we've just kind of finished mm -hmm. going yeah. over that. Um, so over to the other Q and A here. So uh, a comment here: many seniors listen to radio and grow to trust well-known presenters. So we should use this medium. For messaging. Um, thoughts, comments? I guess that's yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did tons. I did the lots on it was the beach before it was the Bruce as well as the CBC um, in the morning. Yes, local and um, larger radio centers for sure. Right. Um, and uh, Fen and, and uh, Ashley and Hung, do you want to just jump in on that one? Do you agree or disagree? I agree. Yeah. yeah. Me too. Okay. Yeah. Check that box. Okay. Another another participant has asked a high percentage of the population access their local health units. Is there a way for information to be dispersed through this channel and kept updated? That would be a single source uh, for information. Is there, do you want to uh, hung? Do you want to start on that one? Is a public health unit the proper venue? I totally agree with that. I would add 
that pharmacies, you know, for a like community people like me, if I if I have some some health problem, my first point of contact is community pharmacists. So according to me, community pharmacists play a very important role in, in disseminating the key key health messages. So I would. Uh, yeah, I agree, but just add that community pharmacists should have a, 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 a big role in disseminating the key messages, quality messages. Yeah. Your thoughts, Kristen? Health unit? That's your I, I, the health unit, absolutely. Um, and, and there was another question we, we can tie in at the same place. And do I think that we can depoliticize? They'll use these venues for um, communication at, when public health is employed by government. And I think the answer is yes, because there's a difference between elected official and employed official. The motivations are very different. Um, employed individuals are not working for future votes. So uh, understanding where their motivations lie, absolutely. And then to the piece about community pharmacy would be great. Every piece of public facing communication that I did was unpaid. That's where the challenge lies and why it makes actually more sense for it to go through public health because these are people who are who have the time because they are paid to do the things and may very well get support in them. I was doing it in addition to filling all the prescriptions and answering all the questions in the pharmacy, triaging people who didn't um, want to go to Emerge and didn't have access to the family doctor. So while I appreciate the trust in community pharmacy, there's just no funding for it. And it's a high risk for burnout. And you certainly won't see it from a number of the chain pharmacies because they have restraints on the amount of social media presence they have. I'm self-employed, so it's very, very different. And this is right up your alley. Yeah, I agree. Um, the public health units would be one place that a lot of people would look to, especially in uh, in what in something like this, which is population health, right? But um, I think it just goes back to some of the earlier things that we we're talking about in that people access information in a wide variety of ways. So it would be very challenging practically to say this is where you go, and that's kind of the one source that you that you rely on. I think by nature, people will receive information from all paths of their, their, their daily life. So if they talk to somebody, they might say something, right? If they turn on the TV, it might say something different. Um, it, it would be very, practically, it would be very difficult to kind of redirect all of that. But it would be nice to say, the to, to identify a few sources that, that would be considered the trusted sources. And like you said earlier, maybe make that a bit more structured in terms of mm. how this information is disseminated. Ashley, do uh, you have any experience with this, uh, using the health unit as a sole source? Um, I think as a, a sole source, I, it again runs into all of those challenges that folks have brought up. I think it's an important source as as part of the complement. And I think to the point about politicization as well, right? sort of having those conversations about who are the public service sector um, folks and and the nonpartisan folks versus the you know partisan political conversations could be clarifying in in those points too and and sort of key messaging that also goes alongside health messaging. Um, but I think generally, yeah, the the multiple sources of communication can also be useful because some folks just may not trust their public health unit w whether or not they think it's partisan or or nonpartisan. Uh, interesting. Um, I will just quickly, sorry, Dan, I just yeah. will quickly add one point is that what what we know how people develop that sense of trust is a lot, a large part of it is in their personal experiences. Mm -hmm. So if they have had a negative experience, they will have less trust in that particular source, or if they're family members or people they know. Right? So, so that that's why it's, it's quite an individual experience when we talk about what's the best way to communicate with different people. We're getting a lot of uh, uh, comments here uh, very quickly. Uh, um, here's one for you, Kristen, directed at you. Kristen, do you believe depoliticization is possible as long as public health is employed by government? Got a one or I, two sentence answer. I there. do. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I do because I it's not about, um, it's elected officials are in it for the votes and paid officials are there to do the work. Um, and, and I really, something that, I said a lot to people um, when I was doing a lot of my communication is like 
first, I wasn't paid to do most of my communication. And what would I get out of deceiving people? And do they really think that I would do seven years of a professional education with intent to deceive? Whereas you have to look at the motivations of the, the political actors, essentially. So that's really important. And then the other thing I always do is I tell people, well, this is what I'm doing with my family. And when I relate it to my kids, especially with vaccines, like I got my kids there, COVID and flu shot last week. And a lot of my patients will go, well, if you did that, because that's, you, you relate it to them in a way that they can um, relate it back, right? I commend you on that trust you've built in your community. That isn't always the case. Um, there's an interesting comment here about communities that only rely on written and verbal communication. And the example is the Mennonite community. And um, I certainly uh, wonder how that, how messaging to communities like that might best be done. Uh, Ashley, do you wanna try that one? Sure, yeah, I mean, I think, um... In some ways, th there have been studies in, in other regions that look at the importance of community leaders um, in response often to crises or, or disaster or catastrophe. And community leaders can really um, plug into uh, the network that they already have in an effective way to share messaging, but also address concerns um, that are, that are going to arise within the community as trusted sources. And um, operate to, to kind of relay information back or in forth and accommodate that into a community. So um, I think that that's a useful approach to, to think about how to share information broadly. It doesn't just necessarily have to be the health professionals or health experts, right? They can work with other folks to get messaging out. Yes, that's, that's an excellent point that you raise that uh, there, there, I think there have to be other sources and mm -hmm. somehow uh, they have to be incubated, I think, in society uh, so that when this happens again, they're ready to go. Um, another comment here uh, was from a pharmacy student, second year student at the School of Pharmacy, and I'm not sure which one, uh, currently incorporating the importance of patient communication within our curriculum and learning about the different ways it can be done. I believe that staying transparent with the general public that the information is ever changing is a helpful way to manage expectations as mentioned. I guess that's a given. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that, but it's an interesting comment. Um, I would, sorry, sorry. Go ahead, Monk. So I would like to say that Achana Yemohan is the, is the student in the team that helped me uh, with oh. a lot of work in this re this re research. And I can say that she contribute a lot with our, I cannot finish this project. So um, for, for some reason it's not, she's not able to join us today, but uh, yes, uh, she is really a uh, promising well, that's good. That's uh, student. That's good to give her that uh, recognition. Thank you. Um, Another comment here is, I think the sharing of local number of confirmed cases, hospitalizations, and deaths through the local public health units was very useful. Mm -hmm. Personally, I shared this information daily through social media in my local community. I was nominated twice for a community award because of this. Mm -hmm. so I was very much appreciated by the community. That's, that's nice. Um, I want to ask a general question here that just came to mind, and we are getting to the end here. So uh, is fear a good uh, way to message? Uh, Krista mentioned negative, but I is it is it proper, uh, ethical, and appropriate to spread fear in the populace to get compliance? And I throw that open to uh, start with you, Ashley. Sure. And the, and the easy question, right? No, I mean, I think in some ways it is, it's it's uh, fundamentally a question of what we mean by, by fear, right? So if you're just spreading fear to scare people into doing something, I think ethically that's very concerning, right? The messaging is itself going to be a little bit scary and you're probably going to feel fear because the situation is scary. So I think it's a, a question of proportional messaging and emotions. You don't want folks to be overwhelmed with fear and feel like they can't do anything or they have to do this one thing otherwise it's all over right so so i think um fear is going to be 
it's sort of built into some of this messaging because of the subject, but you shouldn't be relying on that as a tactic to to gain compliance and that sort of thing. If if that if the distinction I'm making there is uh, makes sense, but but we also want to relate the dangers, right? So um, and and again, that speaks I think to that point about transparency. So there are real dangers here. The dangers may vary across say certain demographics, right? So maybe if you already have a disability, you need to think about this a little bit differently and how can we mitigate this? But but a, a full on sort of campaign of fear, I think is is really counterintuitive and it, it uh, fundamentally may just overwhelm people and, and make them unable to act. Um, Kristen, do you wanna address that the fear issue? Uh, fear sells, but I don't think it's appropriate. No, and, and a lot of what I was doing was to calm fear. Yeah, it's scary. Yes, there is this thing that was running rampant and, and harming our community, but how can you um, turn that into a way to keep yourself safe? Use that information in a way to keep yourself and others safe. So while it sells, I try really hard not to feed into that negativity when I do um, my, all of my communications. Uh, I definitely get called less when I am less fearful uh, on social media, um, but I think it's the right thing to do. It's it's not ethical to exploit people's fear of situations because for a lot of people, as we saw, mental health um, changes happened mm -hmm. because of the level of fear that they were constantly experiencing. Interesting point, thank you. Uh, Hung, do you wanna mention that or speak to this? I think, uh... The pandemic is scary enough. Our research informants say that they want to suicide. They think it is the war. They think like we are sinking with the ship. I think they are. They have enough fear, and we don't want to to put any more pressure on on their life at all. Our research informants suggest to have informations that are fun, that are optimistic, uh, to their to the, the, their life. That is the things that we should follow. Very good, thank you. And Finn. Yeah, I'll just quickly say that uh, fear as a strategy has its drawbacks too. Um, it reminds me of the story of Cry Wolf. Right? If if uh, if you keep on saying the same thing and it doesn't quite happen the way you said it would happen, then you may lose, you risk losing that trust that you have built so carefully and, and with a lot of effort. Um, and the other thing I'll just uh, quickly mention is that um, with with human behavior, there's multiple domains of motivation. Right? There's there's multiple ways to motivate somebody. We know that uh, there's well, the obvious one people think of is financial incentive, but there's other ones like altru altruism is one. So fear is one driver for sure. But it, I think the 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 a good strategy would be looking at all these different ways to motivate someone into taking action that you want them to take, and not just relying on. We are approaching the uh, end of our hour, and I would like to give everybody 30, 40 seconds uh, for one last comment. Uh, I have a fairly lengthy closing uh, statement to make. So uh, uh, I, I guess you could actually take about a minute. How's that? Uh, so um, why don't I start with uh, you, Hung, and then we'll, we'll go around. Your last words on this topic for today. When we communicate messages to uh, communities, think about what, how to get that community through that communities. We need to make sure that messages reach the communities and are absorbed by the community rather than a general things that fits every community. Okay, that's it. All right, Kristen, last words. I think that's a great message. Uh, when we started vaccine rollout in Ontario, um, something that we did was do it regionally because what works in Toronto does not work in Gray, Bruce, Huron counties. Mm. Um, I also was on the panel that you referred to earlier about the changing messages and how fast that all happened um, with Dr. Ken Milne ages ago, it feels like. And what we talked about was finding a communicator that resonated with you that you felt that you trusted and following them along in their journey. Once you find that person, 
following along in their journey and asking them if you have questions and reaching out to them. Um, many patients, um, I call them patients, many people uh, really connect with their family doctors. It might be their community pharmacist. It might be public health. It might be the radio station, whatever it is, go to that um, and try to block out the noise, understanding what people's motivations are, understanding when there's a community pharmacist who doesn't get paid for any of this communication, what might be their motivation versus a political figure, right? So finding those people, following along with them in, in, in your journey. Thank you. All right, Fen. Thanks, last Dan. Word, uh, last word. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I see that um, people on the Q&A uh, board and, and uh, the panelists have all mentioned this idea of, you know, learning from this experience. And that's that's ultimately, I think, that's what I hope that uh, we're able to do is to, because this hasn't quite happened on this scale before, at least probably not in our lifetime. So I, I'm hoping that we do learn from this experience and look at uh, and get prepared for future such happenings uh, if it were to happen. And there's a saying that says, you know, you prepare for war during times of peace. And, uh, and that's what I'm hoping that our government, as well as healthcare bodies, et cetera, become, and as well as the community, I think they, everybody has a responsibility here. They become more proactive and uh, instead of being reactive uh, to, so that we're prepared for future such events. And Ashley? Yeah, I, I, I think that that's a good point too. And especially when we think about the moment we're in now is, and it sounds like everybody here is doing so much of this work, just listening to where those points of failure were and how folks can do better. So I think that's some, it, I mean, it's been really inspiring and the questions have been really interesting and generative. So I think really sort of taking that moment now to step back and reflect is uh, critically important. So, I mean, Thank you to everyone for, for this really interesting discussion and, and all the questions, because it's, I, I think, exactly what needs to happen. Very good. Well, I thank you. And I'll just add my thoughts that I found this very stimulating and, uh, and interesting. And uh, I think um, while the scientists are out there developing the vaccines, I think the communicators have to be out there developing the messaging or better ways to communicate and looking at better ways. So, in my summary statement, we hope this lecture has proved educational and insightful into discussing uncertainty in community messaging, perspective of rural older adults, and community resilience. Through this lecture series, the Gateway Center of Excellence and Rural Health team strives to better the health and well-being of rural residents through research, education, and communication by providing a range of topics relevant to rural communities. The, the, uh, it goes without saying that we owe all of you a big debt today. So thank you all, Hung Nguyen, uh, our panelists, uh, Dr. Ashley Rose Mellenbacher, Dr. Fen Chang, and pharmacist Kristen Watt. Thank you very much. We would also like to thank our sponsors for their continued support. Without them, the lecture series would not be possible. And these include MicroAge Basics, Goderich, McGee Motors, Goderich, Libro Credit Union, Lighthouse Money Management, Goderich, McEwen and Fagan Insurance Brokers, Goderich, Huron Telecommunications Cooperative Limited, or Huron Tel, Zares, Goderich, the Legion Branch 109, Goderich, and CIBC Wealth Management. I want to thank the Gateway board members and staff who make this program possible. Jay McFarland's been our senior producer going on three years now. And working with him to deliver these lectures are Carissa Eckert, Gateways Communications and Administrative Coordinator, and Sage Milne, Research Assistant at Gateway. Gateway Center of Excellence in Rural Health is a not-for-profit organization with charitable status, and we greatly appreciate and welcome the support we receive. If you would like to donate to Gateway to support this lecture series and Gateway's rural health projects, I encourage you to visit our website at gatewayruralhealth.ca and click the donate button. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, or sign up to get email notifications on our website. Before closing, I want to tell you about Gateway's launch of Rural Southwest Ontario Shed Talks. 
This launch will take place at the Brussels Four Winds Event Barn on December 1st from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Shed Talks focuses on farmers' well-being and rural agricultural barriers. The principal speaker will be Peter Johnson, better known as Wheat Pete. Price is $20 per person, and lunch will be provided by Pine Ridge Barbecue. And for those of you who know this source of dining, uh, that's really good value. To register, visit www.gatewayruralhealth.ca. And finally, our next lecture is on Tuesday, December 5th, 2023 at 12 noon, when Cassandra Bryant, PhD candidate at the University of Guelph and Gateway Research Chair will present on her continuing research into the impact of COVID-19 on the rural healthcare workforce. We hope to see you then. Wish you all a good day and thank you again very much for participating. Bye now.